Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 1 million high-quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative project to the next level. For 30% off of your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE6. Those Orion pirates were definitely a nuisance, Spark. You almost died because of their interference. Yes, Doctor. Apparently, some people still believe that theft of other people's goods is a valid way of life. In the end, the Orions may finally have learned the lesson that stealing is wrong and crime does not pay. It's Frame Rate. Hey guys, welcome to Frame Rate, episode 128. I'm your host, Brian Brushwood, and this is the long anticipated, much vaunted, uh, long uh, agonized over episode without merit. Tom Merritt is on assignment, I believe, swimming in a pool somewhere. So I pulled in two of my BFFs for the rest of the world to maybe make a cyber Voltron version of Tom Merritt. So please welcome to the show once again, Mr. Justin Robert Young and Scott Johnson of the podcast uh, Frog Pants Network, right? The, the podcast network, right. You had it right the first time. <laughs> the podcasting frogs network, as I like to call it. And uh, while that go. would be an incredibly big story, it is not our big story. This just in, the big story. Uh, the first big story looks on the surface to be pretty much a tale of old media beating up on young media, question mark. But I think there might be something more to it. A couple of places reporting this out of uh, CNET and All Things D. Uh, allegedly, Time Warner Cable says that uh, has admitted that it is maneuvering to preserve some exclusives and to block some programmers from putting their content out on the web, and it, but yet insists that it's not holding up the development of web TV. Did you guys get a chance to read this story? Uh, absolutely. I want everybody to understand that Sesame Street style, this episode will be brought to you by the letter E for exclusivity. It is... <laughs> throughout all the stories we're going to talk about today. And this is really no exception. What we have here is Time Warner saying, yes, during the agreements that we make for rights carriage fees, of which have consistently gone up over the past 30 years, we are asking that they don't also sell this programming directly to other quote-unquote cord cutter uh, online only outfits. Uh, I, I have a hard time seeing that this as, as wrong. I mean, this is kind of why they're paying these exorbitant fees to begin with, right? It, well, it, yeah, it It's nasty th ball, but I think it's fair ball. Let, let me hear what Scott has to say before I well, tell you. Well, I, I agree. With, with that statement you just made, I think, is, a, is, is, uh, is prescient to this conversation. I believe that this is yet another example of, and it's easy just to go, old media trying to keep the ropes and tie everybody down and, and you know, hold off, hold off the fight till the bitter end. But, and you could maybe boil it down to that. But this is these guys and others just trying to figure out what their future is. Now, and some of the tactics... That, yeah. that, they're, that they're reported to be using are uh, paying extra in order to preserve exclusives for a longer time or, more importantly, using intimidation tactics of threatening to, to drop certain content providers if they don't play ball and continue to give them the exclusives. And the question, of course, is at which point are they acting more like a monopoly and causing more trouble? Obviously, we, we, if you're a content creator, you like the idea of having more broadcasters, more rebroadcasters wanting to pay you extra in order to keep your content exclusive, uh, maybe less a fan of intimidation tactics? Well, but yeah. I mean, but but what, I mean, number one, if you are a content creator, you are the fan of getting in front of the most people, not necessarily having the most people offering you money. 
Uh, and that is why they are able, the, the cable companies for now are able to offer these kind of deals or make these kind of negotiation tactics. But I don't see this as a monopoly so much as I see it as these are these companies trying to do their best to hold on to what they have in an era where content is now king and they understand that they can go to other places. But in terms of the exclusivity of, of them holding on to this, this stuff, I, I, I kind of agree with what Time Warner said where they're like, well, what's the difference between us trying to pay for exclusivity and Netflix creating content to remain exclusive to that Yeah, platform? the exact quote it here is, quote, it is absurd to suggest that in today's highly competitive video marketplace, obtaining some level of exclusivity is anti-competitive. Exclusivities in Windows are extremely common in the entertainment industry. That's exactly how entertainment companies compete. This is why, for example, you can only watch Fast and Furious 6 in a movie theater, not in your living room, Sunday Ticket on DirecTV, and the new Arrested Development episodes on Netflix. In fact, the amount and scope of exclusivity and windowing in Time Warner Cable's arrangements with programmers pales in comparison to that found by other players in the entertainment ecosystem. So I guess that's a little bit of like, yeah, but they do it worse. So there. Yeah, basically. But here, this is really an important point of all this, I think. We are seeing the digital slash modern day analog digital cable equivalent of the old studio systems. And the way those worked were you had big stars. You got big stars in the picture, see? And it worked for you, the guy who ran Huge Studio. And you didn't let that star go anywhere else. And that was a weird setup. The way you stayed powerful is you kept your exclusives to yourself. In those cases, those were flesh and blood actors and actresses. And those were, you know, films with big deals and directors and things. And those directors couldn't go anywhere else. They couldn't do independent cinema for, you know, for sure, let alone, you know, go to another studio and do something. When that happened, it was really rare and weird. And eventually that system didn't hold. So it fell apart and it didn't work. And now we kind of have new ways of doing things for a long time. And I feel like we're just at that point again. Everybody's holding on to their equivalent of an actor they don't want to get rid of or somebody who's important to them and their bottom line. In this case, it's shows, it's showrunners, it's content, it's IP. And they're going to hold it for dear life. And I don't blame them one bit. I don't think it's going to go on forever. I think this is all going to change. But what else are you going to do? That is your position of power. You have to hold but, what but, you have. But Scott... The, the difference is that now these companies are paying above market value for it. They are saying, listen, we'll pay you more if you keep it only to us. And that's where I think it's different. Now, to say that they're going to drop certain channels, that I think is a slightly more complicated issue as we're going to get to in some of these stories a little bit later. Yeah, before we move on real quick, uh, we've mentioned it before, but if you read uh, The Master Switch, a book about how information empires crumble, the trend is, as Scott pointed out, that in the early days, you have a disruptive new media. You have everybody running a land grab to figure out what their brand is until the next disruptive media comes out. And then you have Band-Aids like this that try to keep the structure in one place until finally it crumbles all the way down. Uh, but uh, I guess, let's. Uh, speaking of which, one of the things a lot of these people do is they try to come up with a new novel form of presentation, which directly ties into yet another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Question, <laughs> panelists. Is TV 3D, is 3D TV in the living room totally dead? Yes. I mean, to ask that question, Brian, you really have to philosophically understand whether it lived. Yeah. Uh, yes, well, it, that's, that's exactly the case. Now, the latest story comes out of The Verge. Is 3D TV dead? ESPN 3D to shut down by the end of 2013. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to not want to do a giant victory lap on this because even as for the last two years, it, after the meteoric rise of the rebirth of 3D in the cinema, we saw a Me Too tag-along at CES of all these 3D televisions of every variety. Unfortunately, whereas uh, storytelling and 3D and the technology had advanced considerably over the last decade in theaters, it had not for televisions. You were dealing with, uh, with very old technology, uh, active shutter displays that gave you headaches or polarized views where you had expensive glasses for everyone uh, that, that, that didn't work as well as the circular polarized. Uh, many people... Here on this network, we're saying that the move to 3D was too fast, too much, and there wasn't enough consumer demand. And it certainly looks like shutting down ESPN 3D was the case. Uh, quick question to you guys. Have either of you ever experienced 3D television in a friend's home, like in the natural oh, no, environment? No, no, no. And I think, I think, 
uh, we've we've almost already talked too much about 3D television. You know, it's <laughs> it, just and even acknowledging it, it's 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 dead to me and it's dead to everybody. It's dead. It's been dead. If it's been walking around, then it's been zombified. Yeah. But what I want to point out here with with the ESPN 3D is very, very interesting because why does a gigantic channel and the infrastructure that would need to be put in place for ESPN to record all these games with special cameras and special crews, uh, that it was a tremendous expense. How are they able to do that? Because ESPN can say to cable carriers, carry this 3D channel, incur the expense of going through, uh, you know, to, to carry this very big signal and put it in all of your homes because we're ESPN and in our, our agreement to keep ESPN on your on your cable system, you're going to also need to carry this channel. Now, the fact that they have taken it off is also interesting because they've had a lot of cost cutting there at ESPN over the past three weeks, which anybody who you can just Google ESPN and uh, yeah, I think Deadspin has carried a lot of their layoff stuff. But it's because they are paying more and more for live sports package carriage fees. And that's where, again, we get back to the central idea of exclusivity of content. ESPN is paying for exclusivity. Therefore, they are having to shutter other projects that are kind of dead on the vine and maybe larks to begin with, like ESPN 3D. I don't disagree with any of this. In fact, I agree with it wholeheartedly, but I'll say this about 3D that I think it makes it interesting in our growing entertainment market where we have growing choices. And that is this. Normally... Success of content lots of times depends on the uh, penetration of a technology that will carry that content to you. So it's either VCRs, which won out that fight and beat beta, or it's DVD over something else, or it's Blu-ray over HD TV or HD DVDs. Whatever it may be, whatever the prominent technology is that, that is in the installed base of homes usually wins the day. And then content is made for that because there is this base that you can deliver your content to. 3D is a really weird case because... You can't buy a TV, just about, just about true. You cannot buy a TV at Costco, for example, in a, in a large configuration that doesn't have 3D built in. It's all standard stuff now. And every time you go in there to buy a TV, you're getting 3D capability out of those things for the most part. And yet nobody wants to bring content to that in any form. Video games, all that stuff died on the vine. You notice at E3, nobody talked about 3D at all. Like it was Zip, not a, the E3 previous to that. Sony couldn't shut up about it. They made a TV for it, for heaven's sakes, just for game consoles. Like that went from, you know, awesome to nothing. Uh, and I think that's just interesting that we have an installed base of 3D televisions and nobody gives two craps about building t uh, content for it now. Well, well, either that or, I, they, or I, they did and now they're pulling out. I, th I think you actually hit upon something here because uh, in in the late 90s, every you couldn't buy a new computer without a DVD drive and nobody was using the DVD drives for everything, for anything at all. It was uh, like maybe you would watch a movie be like, why would I want to watch a movie on my 17-inch monitor when I have a big, uh, you know, not even high def, a big screen television at home? But it wasn't until there was a big enough install base that all of a sudden a new use for those drives to to have uh you know video game assets the ability to put five gigabytes of of background assets for you know whatever game all of a sudden they're like well hey we got you know 60 percent market penetration that's enough that we can start selling these bigger games uh unlike that with with 3d televisions there's not anything besides just the 3dness to it now that technology if it could be used for something else that did provide a bigger value you know i could see that happening but for right now it's pretty clear that uh, at least as it exists now with either the active shutter or or the um you know the the, the lenticular displays or whatever uh the the customers have spoken. Yeah, just about the only device that I think delivered on its promise of 3D was uh the 3DS and it, even that's a pain sometimes and you have to sort of do it on a game by game basis but And, and that was without glasses. Right. Yeah. That's without that's an I mean, important factor in this. That, that's that's, that, that's, that maybe, was the that, that's maybe the most important factor here is that you don't have to put on some clumsy glasses. You can just play that thing. And if you don't like it, you can turn it down. And if you really don't like it, you can turn that thing off. And that's a huge that's a huge part of this. Otherwise, it's an ordeal. Where are all my remotes? I don't know. They're probably in a box with those four pairs of glasses we paid too much for. These have scratches on them. The dog ate one. Like there there are home there are home problems. That let 3D not be a thing that I gave that I gave too much care for when it uh, when it happened. Well, the good news is that I'm certain the death of 3D and the yanking of 3D from ESPN will surely be the last terribly negative story that we have. Let's move on to another big story.
Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Lucas and Spielberg predict a massive implosion in the film industry. That's our other positive spin story that we have right here. Uh, at a recent talk, this is also coming from The Verge, although I believe you can see the raw footage of them talking about it at the University of Southern California. Uh, they talked about uh, the, the, the train wreck currently headed towards the, uh, the movie industry, or at least that's how they represented it. They lamented the fact... That soon, <laughs> soon you're not going to be able to see movies like Lincoln at the theater. The fact that everyone has home theaters is going to ruin everything. And that ticket prices are going to spiral out of control and become incredibly expensive. Soon it'll cost $25 to see Iron Man, they said. It'll be $50 just to go see a movie. Uh, and, and what a tragedy that's going to be. Uh, Justin, is there any positive spin to this? I mean... George Lucas was out in the sun, right? Was it outside? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was at night, unfortunately. It was, was at, it was at night. Okay. Ever. Then, then that, no, you're right. No, nothing positive came from it at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't... These guys know film and the film business better than all of us combined. So, I mean, it's hard to say that they are, you know, anything other than prescient in, in stuff like this. But uh, I think that it's... I, I kind of disagreed with Lucas's point of view that we were going to have fewer movies stay in theaters longer. Uh, I, I do think we are always going to have the the tent poles that we see kind of now, but that there might be a more, a greater proliferation of smaller theaters that, you know, maybe those are the theaters that only show one movie for a longer period of time and want to provide in the way that the Alamo Draft House does the unique cinema experience tailored to that one film. But, uh, you know, other than that, I mean, I think it's it's definitely take your pants off. The, the revolution is here. It's it's a it's a crazy world and grab a knife. Yeah, but here's the thing. These two guys are, they essentially invented the tentpole film, really, if you get want to yes. get right down to it. Uh, the thing yes. before them was what? Uh, the Sound of Music was maybe the biggest deal uh, before your Spielbergs and your, no, and your Lucas's Jaws, kind of... Jaws invented the summer movie and Star Wars invented the summer blockbusters. They literally, yeah. they were the one-two punch that brought us the season for which we are in the middle of. Right, and it's because of that that we have these temple experiences. Why you have Man of Steel doing the kind of money it did yesterday. Why Iron Man ran away with it this year. They established this pattern. The problem is, can an entire industry stick to that pattern? There's a great quote in here. A studio would rather invest $250 million in one film for a real shot at the brass ring. It sounds familiar to me like, oh, I don't know, another industry I like quite a bit, like video games. I think sure. video games are heading toward the same bubble. This is a bubble we're talking about. Uh, in a lot of ways, you've got a lot of people vying for that brass ring, lots of big, big money movies. And when they crash, they crash really hard. I feel like we're just waiting for the big story when some, you know, medium to large size studio takes a complete dump because of some movie they bet on and bet wrong on. I don't know what that is yet. It's hard to predict that. But I don't think you ignore these guys. It's not like they just walked out of IFC competitions and said, hey, we think this. They These guys know. They invented it. If anything, they're like the Manhattan Project guys. They built the bomb. Now they're sorry it's blowing up. That's a terrible See, example. I shouldn't have used it. But you know what? It, I mean, it, it's it's not like there's three random jerks on a podcast just spouting <laughs> their opinions. Uh, all right. So let's try this on for size. I'm going to take the other position because I read this entire article and I noted everything they predicted and I agreed it's going to happen uh, and every trend they said, and, and the effect of everything, and I was totally cool with it. I thought it was great across the board. Uh, what's so great about seeing Lincoln in particular in the movie theater? You know, I am i didn't go to the see it in the movie theater because I don't want to spend $50 to go see it. This, this idea of you're going to end up spending $50 to go see a movie, I already do that because I, I've gotten to the point now where I, if I go to the movie theater, I want an enhanced experience. I want to be served beer and pizzas while I'm watching it. I want, you know, and I'll go and see movies in 3D. I like the novelty of seeing it in theaters. If it's a smaller movie, if it's an independent film, one thing I loved was that Upstream Color was available uh, just about day and date uh, for in, in my home. I paid $20 for the for the HD download of Upstream Color so I could watch it in my office with Bonnie. It was great. I didn't have to go. I didn't have to fight with anyone at the movie theater. I didn't have to listen to some or risk, run the risk of somebody else ruining my presentation. I could pause it if the kids had some kind of disaster. Uh, it was nothing they said bothered me. I'm okay with better experiences at the movie theater 
and more availability for more content. Uh, one of the things they were lamenting was they said, uh, uh, Lucas said, I think eventually Lincolns are going to go away and they're going to be on television. And Spielberg said, and mine almost was this close. Ask HBO this close. And to me, I'm like, well, what would have been a disaster about that? Because well, I, I mean, did, did you? I, I, I didn't. I didn't listen to the raw the raw video, but did you get the sense that they were lamenting it, or they were just saying that this is the trend? Well, certainly, the, this is the way the article is written in, in the Verge, and and I do get the impression that they're they're calling it. But but every time I've seen this story in the press, they've acted like this. I mean, I mean, look at this massive implosion. Certainly doesn't doesn't imply that uh, everybody's well, really that, that, happy about this upcoming. Oh change. yeah, no, I think that. They're saying that, that that model is going to have a massive implosion. But, I mean, I think for guys like those, I mean, they're going to be able to get their stuff somewhere, you know. Well, and, and specifically, I think uh, specifically, and uh, this is the prediction they made that I think uh, where the massive implosion line is is relevant, is they say you're going to see two to three massive failures in the $250 million category where they invest a whole bunch of movie in something that just doesn't take off. And it's such a financial loss that the big studios stop wanting to to take those big risks. Because as Scott was saying, right now, everyone's eyes is on that prize and they do want to have this, this massive worldwide success. But after a few more failures, and that looks like a riskier strategy, you could see, you know, again, as they put, a massive well, implosion. Well, part of the problem is we expect more too, right? So when I go to a movie, I need it to, to live up to the 60 bucks I paid for tickets and food or whatever. And if it doesn't, that's supremely disappointing and there's a less likely chance I'm going to go back to that theater and do that all over again unless I have some other kind of assurances. And that's a really subjective thing anyway. Who knows if I'm going to like Man of Steel or not until I get in there and see it or whether or not that was worth my 60 bucks. So that's that's a weird little twist in this. We As we will get more picky about what's good or bad and those bets cost 250 and north million dollars to, to, to gamble on whether or not me and lots of people like me like the thing. That's that's dangerous for the studios and for their system of making money. That's very dangerous because that's where they're counting on making all their money. I think all they're saying in this article, all they suggested is this is a shift that isn't necessarily bad. It's a shift nonetheless, and things are going to change. Lucas said this, the shift will present new opportunities both for consumers and filmmakers. Viewers will have access to a wider variety of programming, usually more interesting than what you're going to see in a movie theater anyway. So all they're really saying is we have... So many options at home. And as an unplugger, I can testify to this for five, six years now, however long I've been doing it. And I've never looked back and never regretted it. I can get kind of what I want, when I want, however I want to get it. And when people provide it to me so I can pay for it with reasonable amounts of money, then I am all over that. Um, it's all a matter of who is going to be first at saying the next James Cameron movie is direct digital HD. You can pay 20 bucks for it and have them okay. not be nervous well, that it's just you and Bonnie's one thing, dude, but you, Bonnie, and 12 of your best friends for 20 bucks is what they're worried about. No, 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 no. But, but I mean, this is really, and the elephant in the room and what they're talking about is this is not necessarily the studio system imploding because really, like, they would be happier to have more avenues to get their 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 movies out. It's the traditional method by which we go to the theaters because that's the that's the big shoe that has yet to drop the studios would love to experiment more with day and date kind of stuff it's these it, it's the movie theaters for which is the biggest way that they make their money is by the exhibitor fees that the movie theater chains pay uh that are the ones who are like no you can't do that you we're already dying and you would be stabbing us yet again with another sharper more decorative knife uh, that all the kids like because it's really convenient. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's it's not. I mean that that's really what will change. And and the idea of making the two hundred fifty million dollar movie that everybody wants to go see is based on getting them all to go see it in the theaters. Once that relationship really breaks, which is destined to happen, then mm -hmm. I think. We are going to see our, our our frame of how we look at the studio system will be different because I think what we think of as the studios wanting to do something is really the studios protecting the relationship of their greatest revenue stream, which are the theaters. Absolutely. Uh, all right, so let's move on. And uh, we got a fourth story. It's not as big as the other ones.
Direct TV executive blasts broadcasters at a congressional hearing. Uh, let me get this guy's name. This is an L.A. Times story that somebody forwarded <laughs> to me over Twitter. Uh, in a testimony to the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Communications and Technology, Direct TV executive vice president Mike Halkovic said new rules are needed for broadcasters when it comes to negotiating and distribution contacts. Uh, contracts with pay TV distributors. Basically, they're talking about, he called the system completely broken, saying that it's a 600% increase per subscriber between 2010 and 2015 for the retrans fees, which we've talked about and stuff like Aereo gets around. Uh, and then meanwhile, other folks, let me see, get the um, uh, Marcy Burdick, a uh, senior VP for Broadcaster Shirts Communication, says, quote, the retransmission consent system in place today has a success rate of 99 percent. Only in Washington, D.C. could something that works 99 percent of the time, providing for thousands of deals every year, be called broken, she testified. Oh, I'm, well, a little, I'm a little blown away by some of these numbers. Check this out. 1992, the broadcasters, meaning the big four, right, or the big three even. No, there was Fox was there then. Uh, sure. They own four. They own four cable channels today. They own over 104 cable channels. A tw uh, 2,500 percent ownership increase. Now I don't know what that means on the good or the bad or the ugly, but good lord, man. Here's they here's what it means, and and this is the other side of the the first story that we were talking about in terms of you know intimidation tactics being used to say, well, we don't want to you know carry your stuff unless you play by our rules. On the content creator side of this, you have all these companies like ESPN with their ESPN 3D or Disney doing that for ESPN saying, okay, well, if you want to carry this channel, you also have to carry this, 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 and this channel. So if you want to carry FX, you also have to carry Fox Soccer and Fox Knitting and Fox Hamster Wheel going around four times. <laughs> sure. Uh, my that favorite of awesome. Foxes for the record. Yeah. And they're not, they're not hamsters. <laughs> no. And, and that's what DirecTV is saying. Hey, poor us. All we're doing is getting raked over the coals because rights carriage fees get more valuable every year and the rights carriage people get more pushy every year. And so that's where on the other side of this, there's the, you know, Time Warner being in the same position that DirecTV is, is saying, and now they want us to also let them sell their product twice to another company when we're paying for exclusivity. So it's it's a really complicated issue that these people have gotten themselves into. Uh, well, all right. I, well, I would I would pay listen, ahead. I'll get I'll get cable again, I'll pay for it again if I get foxes in a running wheel. You've convinced me to come back. I'm <laughs> plugging back in. Foxes in a running everybody. wheel. Yeah. <laughs> That's my new adventure flick I'm really excited about. Uh, hey, let's take a moment and thank the folks who make Frame Rate possible. We're talking about our friends over at Shutterstock.com. Uh, I don't know how often you guys create your own content. Scott, you ever create any content of any uh, variety? A little bit here and there. Yeah, it's hobbies, you know, stuff. Yep. You ever things. get you ever get in a situation where like you feel like you need to get like a high quality stock video clip, but like your 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 five D's busted, and you're like, well, I guess just no no high quality clips for I, me. I actually use Shutterstock and have for a number of projects, including Frog Pants TV and uh, um, some other art projects. And I've convinced three different clients to use Shutterstock. Like they have had everything I've ever needed, and this stuff is like pro, and it's and it's nope. not that expensive. What is it that you like the most about Shutterstock? Because first of all, if those of you don't know, uh, they got over a million high quality video clips. Uh, Shutterstock helps you make your creative projects to the next level. You could get a 30% uh, discount off of our new account uh, with uh, frame rate six. Basically, whether it's your website, whether it's content that you're creating, you said for Frog Pants TV, you want to look good. You don't want to have to leave the house. And you could take the the expertise of media makers worldwide with their uh, their hand curated clips. Uh, they add over ten thousand video clips every single week. So every time you visit, you'll see something new. Uh, what did you like most about Shutterstock, Tom? Well, you could I could hire a guy to do a bunch of you know After Effects work and make me some lower thirds and do me some cool backdrop stuff and all that. Or I could go there and choose from thousands of them already made, all unique all interesting, find something that matches really well and use that. Even better, I have to design a lot of stuff for a certain client where we're creating a lot of things with patterns. And I need a lot of vector work for that. I can go create my own patterns very slowly in uh, Illustrator all by my lonesome, or I can save, I can't tell you how much time by going there and just browsing through just a few 
of their uh, of their patterns, and they all fit. And the client's always freaking out because they're such high quality. And I'm not just jumping straight to the telling them where I got them either. I make them think <laughs> I did it. But it's amazing stuff. They really have the best selection band. I've used for that kind of thing. Yeah, they got uh, they got uh, sophisticated search tools. You can search and drill down by category, resolution, contributor, and more. They got shareable clip boxes, so you can save video assets to a clip box and access them anytime. They also have a huge image library of photos, vectors, icons, infographic templates for all of your creative needs. And uh, we, of course, thank them for covering us here at uh, Frame Rate. Frame rate six, 30% off all your new accounts. Let's take a dip into the strip slipster, the strip sleeve. That is, of course, where we strip and then sleam our way skeezily down the road. Gross. The Slipstream is streaming services, the services that bring you the shows and channels that you dig. And we got uh, this one came from uh, Mark. Doesn't say where this article was sent in. Uh, Mark K, I assume over Twitter. Uh, the mega ticket concept. For World War Z, this is exactly what we were just talking about, about unique presentations, right, Justin? Uh, absolutely. So they want to go ahead and give you the the big package. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it includes, but uh, it'll be... It, 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 the big package includes getting to see the movie two days early. Now, it's $50, but you get to see the movie two days early in 3D, and you get a small popcorn, and you get the promise that when the Blu-ray comes out, you'll own it. And that it's that last part that I think on paper has the biggest value, but in my gut would be the least satisfying part of this bargain. Well, there's five. So, you're, so you're, go, uh, go ahead, Justin, go ahead. Uh, you, you're looking, studios are looking for a way, because if you look at like movie, you know, grosses that we look at a lot when we do the summer movie draft, the biggest breakdown that you see is like, okay, well, it made this much 2D, this much 3D, this much IMAX. This, these are studios trying to make another category like that without having to have the technological infrastructure to make you pay more money. So they're doing their, you know, all right, jump the window of, uh, you know, jump the window of availability a little bit. And then also they kind of do themselves a favor by saying, all right, well, then X amount of people are going to pre-buy this thing and we'll see how that goes. Now, I think it's not a, a it's not a mistake that they are trying this with World War Z and not Man of Steel because they want to make sure that they get all these things right before they start rolling them out in huge tent poles when they will be judged by audiences as saying, well, this was worth 50 and this was not worth 50. Quick, uh, quick right. correction. I said, uh, I said the Blu-ray disc. It's when the Blu-ray disc comes out, you get a download. So there's not any physical fulfillment on that. And you do get, when you go to the movie theater, a pair of limited World War Z 3D glasses and a full-size limited edition poster. And uh, a small popcorn, that, don't forget. One small popcorn, <laughs> yes. it says here. All of it those are silly. pretty high I wonder margin. if you can upgrade for a quarter. That always gets me. <laughs> uh, about eight bucks. <laughs> Um, so, so here's the other thing. You got to you got to live in L.A. You got to live in Houston. You got to live in San Diego, Atlanta, or Philadelphia. So they are only rolling out this idea in obviously big cities where they can get good test data and stuff. But do you guys think like do you guys think this is just going to roll out everywhere? And I'm going to be able to do this at my local Lehigh Megaplex over here. Without here's the thing. Next year. Really? Right. You think so? Yeah. Here's here's what I perceive the problem is. Uh, what they are doing is they're looking at the assets they have with the distribution and all the movie theaters. And movie theaters in general are pretty uh, homogenous. Uh, but they, they are seeing as people flock to premium experiences like uh, the Alamo Draft House or the Studio Movie Grill or any of these dinner and movie joints that uh, that offer customized, you know, special presentations. Uh, and they're saying, how can we access that level of uh, premium pricing but but using the stuff we have. And so they're, they're doing like, well, we can mail out posters to everyone and we can mail out, you know, these these 20 cent sunglasses or 3D glasses to everyone. And we can promise everyone popcorn. And then the only other thing that they can really offer is we can let them get in a bit early. That's just all the tools they have. And that's why you got this kind of hodgepodge thing. The problem, of course, is when you go to a movie, that's sort of an audition you don't know if you're going to love this movie enough that you're going to want to own it forever. So the fact that they're selling you, pre-selling, like, you're going to see this movie, and if it sucks, you're going to own it forever. So just enjoy that. Um, I, I think they are making the call with the tools they have, but I don't think it's enough to get anyone in. I don't think it's going to expand. I think I think they're, they're being too uh, – they're, they're making the right calls for what they have, but 
I don't think this is going to resonate with. But, but I don't think, think any of this try? is worth fifty bucks. Is the problem? None of this is worth fifty bucks. Like a teaser poster that looks like the same one everyone else is seeing hanging places. There's no exclusivity there. No drink. Somebody mentioned in the chat room. That's kind of a kind of a yank if you're eating that popcorn. Oh, okay. Um, glasses look okay, but you know they, there's probably still fecal matter on those, like all the rest of them at that place. Like I'm not. That's not. None of this is worth fifty. And remind, mind you, this is me paying fifty. My wife paying fifty. My three kids paying fifty. There is zero value in this right now for me as a guy who likes no, to take his family well, to the movies. You you are you are not the target demo for this, Scott. They are for no. they're there for the super fan, the people who are going to see the IMAX movies. And I got three words for you fellas: twenty fifteen Star Wars Avengers <laughs> two. All these gigantic movies. Are you telling me that there's not an audience to see those movies two days in advance for paying 50 bucks and then getting a handshake and, and four T-shirts and a hat with a hole in it? That's absolutely <laughs> something that people are going to go for. Yeah. This I is agree, actually, uh, but it's limited, dude. That's all I'm saying. I feel like they've limited you, there's the value a limited of this 50 bucks. Say, see the new Star Wars two, two days in advance for a, a retarded markup? <laughs> okay, now well, back this up. What if we went back to uh, like like just a, a month ago? What if it was for Iron Man three? Like for World War Z? Part of the thing is two days early for World War Z. I mean, I don't Nobody know who's can. excited about that. But well, Iron a, Man no, three. Wait, this is what they paid? do. World War Z is not interesting to me unless they also make it rated R, like it should be, not this PG thirteen garbage. So maybe then we'll talk. Maybe fifty bucks is worth it if you crank your rating up a little bit. Yeah. But that's. I mean, well, like yeah, like World War Z. <laughs> don't don't focus on World War Z. This is a this is a test run. This is a dry run. There's a reason why they're doing it on this movie because it's not going. They want to make sure that it physically kind of works from pillar to post. That people can buy tickets and then at the end they get their stupid download. This is a uh, concept built for the big fan movies. So the next story we have may be my favorite release of the entire summer. This summer, Netflix will launch multiple user profiles. To keep your recommendations pristine. No longer will folks like me who have kids get to log into Netflix to see <laughs> nothing but recommendations for Dora the Explorer. Or because you watch My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, we think you're going to enjoy uh, whatever other movie. My Little it's Pony Friendship is sometimes complicated. The, the <laughs> tween sequel. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good thing, and it's a really good thing for me for those reasons you just mentioned. I have kids, and they have varying tastes, and I have some that are growing up, and they're watching stuff that, you know, I didn't care about now, but maybe I cared about when I was their age or whatever. And then there's what I watch, and then I've put an extra screw in things because I have this show, Film Sack, where we watch, on purpose, really bad Netflix movies, and we talk <laughs> about them on the show. Now, my recommendations make it look like a nightmare. Like, it's not right what I've done to my family's <laughs> recommendation list so let's separate that all out i'm all for this. this is great yeah it's uh it got better when my kids were able to access the kids only version on the xbox because like i watched uh this film is not yet rated or it was in my queue or whatever so every single time we were calling it up like next to the cartoons was this naked woman being branded uh so uh, that that got better but now the reverse is the kids of course watch so much content on so many devices that I can't even access every single time I went to watch Arrested Development I had to search it again from scratch because it had dropped off my recently watched queue just in the time from from the kids doing everything I am curious though to see how they're going to offer the clean slate like whether or not you start from scratch or if it recognizes like hey when you first open this, these were the movies you like. You want to go back to that? Or if they'll make a guess as to, you know, which are the kids' movies. My, which my, my guess is you have your one haunted uh, <laughs> account, and then you can either choose to start fresh with a new account or uh, just say, well, maybe I can rehabilitate this one and I give the kids their own. Yeah, yeah. probably that. But even, in, I mean, if you imagine the recommendations you get when you mash up SpongeBob SquarePants... Killer Clowns from Outer Space, uh, Blues Clues, and Pulp Fiction. It's a nightmare what you get. It, sounds like, it actually sounds like an indie award-winning film. That's for sure. Uh, exactly. Netflix just Buffalo announced 66 a new deal. is the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix just nice. announced a big deal with DreamWorks Animation to run 300 hours of original TV series uh, exclusively through Netflix, or it says original, so I'm assuming this is in the same vein as their Arrested Development deal, as the House of Cards deal, but original content, uh, kids' shows 
from DreamWorks Animation based on properties, including... Uh, now, we had previously mentioned uh, the Turbo series. You know, the, one of the later movies this summer is, uh, I think it's called Turbo. Fast about the Fast Snails. snails. Yeah. yeah, snail deal, yeah. Flying <laughs> around, man. Those, cra- those snails are crazy. They're getting in their way, man. They're going so goddamn fast. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, they, uh, uh, they're That's developing... That's a snail, man, going by. Other <laughs> properties... Based on characters from, it says it uh, licenses characters from Kung Fu Panda, Madagascar, and Monsters vs. Alien, Aliens to Nickelodeon, which is producing original animated TV shows. So I'm going to assume that those are not the characters it's talking about. Uh, very few details on uh, the amounts and the properties coming. But I do know that in general, I think, I think, uh, I think right now DreamWorks is the best it's ever been in the quality of their animation and presentation and storytelling. And I'm excited to have better content for the kids to watch because a lot well, of the it, stuff they're watching it's right gonna now. It's going to be huge. It'll absolutely be giant. Like there's, there's a reason why they have a section in, in Netflix. I mean, you can go documentaries. You can do, you know, all these horror and, and action and whatever. And there's one that's just freaking kids, just for kids. And they do that because they know that there's a huge part of the audience of Netflix users out there where moms are parking kids in front of seasons upon seasons of, I don't know, Hey Arnold or whatever. And they're just consuming it. And they know there's a market for that to keep people subscribed. This makes perfect sense. It's a totally sweet move for Netflix. And they honestly would be dumb if they weren't pursuing something like this. So that's a huge get. The only thing bigger would be Pixar or something. And they've already got that Disney deal. So... It's great. Keep in mind also, like uh, Netflix Man, is training. Do television. Yeah, well, not well. Keep in mind, keep in mind also that <laughs> that uh, Netflix is essentially training the next generation of of kids to fully expect on demand content at all times. Uh, you know, my five year old now knows how to turn on the Xbox, navigate to Netflix, select whatever movie she wants, and starts watching. That's exactly what Netflix wants. And these are the kids who will continue to watch and rewatch a small library of content over and over and over again, which is exactly what uh, Netflix, of course, caters to. Uh, well, one- and also, this is also a big thing. And, and Brian, you would be the one to you know be able to speak to it as well as uh, Scott. That if, let's say, you take your kid to go see a movie and they really like the characters and all of a sudden they hear that there's a show where they get to see more of those characters and you are not a Netflix subscriber and that show only exists on Netflix... Seems yep. like a pretty big no-brainer just to go ahead and get Netflix, right? Yep. Yep. So speaking and they of somehow that- know. That's the funny thing is they figure this crap out. They know before I do that certain kids' programming is coming. My daughter knew about the Disney deal before I did. She's right now over in that corner drawing, watching Deep Space Nine episode after episode after episode. This is a generation that is raised. This is to what just you teach your kids. Pit. Deep Space Nine. Uh, oh yeah, dude! Freaking look, Odo over there. He probably has to get in <laughs> the liquid form any minute now. It's going to be great. Yeah. All right, so uh, one of the complaints that you get from uh, Hulu Plus is that people hate spending money and then having to watch ads anyway. So UK broadcaster ITV offers a £3.99. I don't know whether it is a shillings, pence. <laughs> I don't know what their cents are, sure. Uh, live TV streaming for iOS uh, that removes commercials. So clearly everyone is going to love this idea and flock to the service, right? Well, well, who a, knows? Yeah, yeah, who, that, yeah. But, but answer, isn't that going to get someone's going to kill it first, right? Because that sounds highly suspicious to me. The the answer is uh, no. For the requested three ninety nine a month, you get act, uh, access to the last thirty days of ITV's catch up program across uh, five different channels without advertising, as well as live simul- simulcast uh, over Wi Fi or three G. And uh, so far, people seem to hate it. They uh, there's a lot of negative comments on the app. Saying what? Pay three ninety nine to remove ads. Why not just use service whatever? And they mentioned a, a, a cloud based DVR type thing. Uh, they expect us to pay to view ITV three and four. And they, of course, these are people who are accustomed to paying a TV license as well. So these people feel like they're being double dinged by having to pay a TV license and then paying again to remove the ads on there. Uh, I'm kind of surprised. This is the first service of this kind that I've really seen where it's like you get a decent spread of, commer- of channels you, with no commercials. It's basically what we're begging for, for Hulu well, Plus, the United States. They have it and then they don't like it. Well, but also, I mean, there is there is a different relationship that they have with those channels that we have with Hulu Plus. You know, like we have a different expectation of Hulu than they have of ITV and the idea that they pay a television tax uh, versus, you know, we 
kind of pay for cable. It's just kind of a, I, I think that there is an expectation thing. And also who knows how well this works, you know, uh, I guess it, it's just like, it's basically just their on-demand library, right? But they've removed no, any it, ads from the on-demand library? Yeah, for, from the catch-up programming, 30 days of catch-up programming, which is basically- Don't use their Britishisms. We're, we're in America, <laughs> Ryan. It's an on-demand library. It's not the catch-up service. Yeah. I'm just, just trying to be accurate on this one. Tom's not here, so I have to be on best behavior. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I This is weird to me. It's weird to me that, well, it's always been weird to me how they get their TV over there. Um, I think it's weird. This idea that's actually kind of triple dinging, uh, Brian, because the way it kind of works is they're getting dinged on the tax. Then they're getting dinged because they're being made to watch commercials again, kind of like we do with cable, basic cable channels. You're paying for that, but then you're paying for it again by having to sit and watch that crap. And then on top of that, they're doing this, which is to remove the second thing you were paying for. To unpay for that, I guess, sort of. So you're kind of getting dinged three ways, and that's that's. Well, weird. and it's Maybe. also, I mean, like, like, what is really the viability of only iOS viewing, right? Like, like, really, right. that kind of uh, programming without ads, you kind of would want also on your television. That's where things are going. I mean, I think that there is. I like watching things on my iPad and my iPhone, but I don't know how much I would pay for only being able to do it there. Right. Now, I should point out, people are pointing out in the chat room that uh, ITV does not get a cut of the license fee. Uh, the license fee only goes to BBC. So ITV is standing on its own, either with advertisements or, in this case, the iOS app getting those uh, removed. But you, but it definitely yeah. sounds like you're dinged if you do, dinged if you don't. You're getting you're dinged, dinged no matter dinged what. Both once in the iPhone, once in the wallet. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> Tech Hive has an article about uh, Comcast's pitch to keep cord cutters with a platform update in 4K video. They did, a, I assume, a technical demo here of what looks like a, a, a pretty looking interface. I mean, it looks a, a bit like, kind of like a Metro iOS kind of hybrid thing, but uh, has a bunch of smart home capabilities in there. So you can set up your channels. It'll make intelligent rec recommendations. And uh, most importantly, souped up HD. We're talking 4K, Ultra HD, they're calling it. And uh, the ability to, with their download speeds, with their new network, be able to download it, as they say, in seconds. I don't know necessarily what that means. They didn't promise any date that this would happen. But uh, from what little we've seen here, is this even worth them investing their time and effort into? Is it possible that Comcast could offer an enhanced experience to the level to where you're happy to continue to pay your monthly cable bill? Well, they're sure not. They're sure not. Uh, I don't know stuff like this. They're not known for their UI or user experience or or flow of data or any of those things. Now that could all change. You hire the right people, you make the right initiatives, and pretty soon you're making really cool user experiences. But just <laughs> looking at this, this thing is lifted off the Xbox 360 uh, dashboard. The font yeah. even there, like that is ridiculous. And it's not that. I mean, everybody's kind of. This is what happens with design. Big new UI ideas come out, and everybody kind of adopts them. We're seeing that with iOS 7 and Windows 8 and and Android, and they're all kind of. Doing doing the same, the same kind of rotation on each other and kind of lifting ideas from each other. So I totally get that. But n this screenshot will never be enough for me. Like Comcast, janky boxes, crappy DVRs, and all, not just them, all the cable providers, all the DirecTV and all the Dish Network people, they're terrible. They've been historically terrible and they're terrible today. If that's going to change suddenly, that will be awesome. But forgive me for being skeptical because that's well, such but, but usually also, I mean, like. You, you still got to, if you're a cord cutter, you still got to pay for internet, right? I mean, I know yeah, here yeah. in my apartment, the fastest, most reliable internet connection is from Comcast. So that's what I'm broadcasting to you on. And I will not speak an ill word of the sweet children. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it, it, it's, so is this their pitch to get cord cutters to buy Te their television service again or uh, well just 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 to don't leave we got something really awesome don't don't be well, hanging well, don't, up don't leave don't leave television or don't leave buying internet from us don't leave uh comcast their exact statement uh comcast chairman ceo brian l roberts called x1 quote an incredible example of what's possible with cloud innovation with the introduction of web-based content to the platform today and the promise of a faster and more integrated experience with x2 we're adding more functionality to each screen in a customer's home and transforming our video product into a complete entertainment operating system wow so I have no idea what that means or if it answers the question <laughs> on whether or not they want me. Because, I mean, if this is a pitch for cord cutters to say, hey, listen, so you're not buying our cable. 
sucks, but here's some other cool stuff. Then I think that's a win-win. I mean, uh, for a lot of people, Comcast is the fastest internet solution for them. And if they get a more and better experience, then I agree with you. Although I'm with Scott, that actually seems like direct, not even just the Xbox panel, but just uh, but the HBO Go Xbox yeah, interface yeah, specifically. It. Like it looks like a direct. It, it, it even looks photoshopped. I'm not going to accuse them of that, but it's just got this feeling of jank. And I don't know what that. You know, like this is less of. Here are more reasons to stay with us. This is, no, wait, here's a different screen. Blah, and stick it in front of my face with the same thing I got to pay for and the same problems I have with paying for it. The reason I don't pay for cable isn't because I can't get it on my iPad. That's not the what? reason. If I, was play, if I was paying for cable, that is a thing that would be cool, but that's not why I quit paying for it. So this doesn't help me at all. Like zero, this gives me zero reason to go back. None. Yeah. Well, and this is all, keep in mind, they didn't just call a press conference and outright say, please stay with us. They, you know, this is all couched as the the premiere of the, uh, you know, the exclusive X2 system that's coming up uh, down the road. So hopefully, you know, if you're already a, a customer of Comcast, you'll be excited about what's coming down the pike. But otherwise, uh, I'm with you guys. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. So we'll see. Uh, I'll believe one more it story. when I understand what they're actually saying, which I don't <laughs> understand now. And I hope to understand in the future. One more quick note, uh, YouTube Network Full Screen. These are the guys behind uh, Five Second Films and uh, I mean, a number of different content uh, productions. Uh, they have 2.5 billion monthly views. And the Churning Group and a few others, uh, Comcast Ventures, WPP Digital, just uh, gave them a fat chunk of change rumored to be in the neighborhood of uh, $30 million. And uh, I guess not much to say outside of that. This is another case of another out-of-the-box content provider uh, at least raising enough attention and enough money from uh, from the powers that be to, uh, it's another, I don't know, it's another vote for new media. Here's, here's, here's what it's a vote for. Original content. Yeah. Yes. Exclusivity of original content. That is what they are creating. That is what they are paying for. Full screen runs more than 10,000 channels on YouTube with more than 150 million total subscribers and 2.5 billion monthly views. Do so you think they're just buying real estate, Justin? I think that they are betting that, you know, the trend that original content will continue to be king is going to, you know, again, win the day. And that it's they would rather be bloody. bet on Dude, these new stars. It's going to be so bloody. This whole thing is just going to be... I mean, we think it's we think it's rough when the, the the music industry had to finally concede and go, all right, these download services are going to be the way we're going to get music to people. We're just going to have to concede this. That was nothing. I feel like this TV thing and just video content generally is going to be a bloodbath. And the stuff like this, when I hear about it and I hear Justin remind me of why they're doing it, and I agree with him, that is exactly why they're doing it. It's why any of them are doing any of this. It's all about original content. That is the power they wield in this era. And it, it's at some point, somebody's going to get stabbed. Someone's going to get shanked. It's going to be bad. I don't know who it is. I don't know who gives up. I don't know who waves the white flag. But at some point, you, Brian, Justin, we don't have, we will not have enough money in our bank account to pay for 500 subscriptions. At some point, it has to give and we have to have three or four central choices, maybe even less than that for most people. That, I don't know when that happens or when that day comes, but there, it's, there's going to be blood Man. You have a cold, uh, apocalyptic view of the future, Scott. <laughs> I kind of do. I kind of right, do. Uh, do about this. It's just so bubbly. It's just waiting to burst. But anyway, let's sorry. Let's Go move ahead. on to Tube Tops. A couple of stories in Tube Tops. Uh, the big one, I'll, I'll do these out of order, Chad. Uh, PlayStation 4, just after, uh, last week, after frame rate, we stuck around and covered the whole thing live. Uh, Scott Johnson was nice enough to join us here. Obviously, yep. we talked uh, and a lot about the gaming side of things, but uh, keep in mind that this is a significant upgrade to the set-top box that's going to live in everybody's living room. What are your thoughts on the PlayStation 4 in that battle for that, uh, you know, that, that home... DVR, the way that you watch, either in this case we're seeing an announcement for Redbox or the uh, Netflix or, or Hulu, or the way you watch content in the living room, what, what, do, what are the prospects on the PS4? Well, I mean, traditionally the Xbox has had, uh, well, it had a bit of a head start, but it also earlier out of the gate had better options. Unfortunately, a lot of those options ended up being behind the paywall. They still are today. If you're not a gold subscriber and you have an Xbox, you can't watch Netflix, which is a little silly because... 
The, again, there's your double, there's your double, what would we call it earlier? The double poke? Whatever it was. Anyway, you're getting <laughs> the, the double twice. ding. The double ding, that's it. It was nothing like poke. I don't know where I got the word poke from. But anyway, <laughs> um, that was a that, that was kind of a weird thing. And I always thought it was a little bit weird. Uh, you know, Sony kind of got their crap together. PS3 has a, a pretty good Netflix player and a good Hulu app and all these things. And they were outside of a paywall. I think that moving forward... Uh, and I think this has been confirmed somewhere, but I haven't read it specifically, so forgive me if I'm wrong. But there's no way Microsoft continues forward with those things being behind the live paywall any more than Sony would do it behind, you know, PSN Plus or anything like that. So what I think is going to happen is there's going to be more parity there than people think. I think they're all going to run the same apps. They're not going to have much in the way of exclusive access to any of these apps like Netflix, Netflix or Hulu or any of these kinds of deals. Microsoft may swing something uh, with sports programming like they already have with the NFL and others. But when it comes to just like, I want to watch movies, I think it's going to be, these machines are going to do basically the same sort of stuff. And it's going to get to the point outside of, you know, connect hand motions and telling your machine to change channels and having a Skype call in the middle of something. Those differences aside, you're going to be able to get the content in both <coughs> places, relatively easy in both places. And then it just boils down to the games again. And that's what wins that generation for those guys. Now, let's say Sony's out of the gate really strong. You saved 100 bucks on that console. You like their non-DRM stance or whatever your reasons for switching and or sticking with Sony this year. If that happens with a lot of people, that opens up new doors. That opens up channels for all kinds of exclusivity deals within those apps. Netflix does about, something just for PS4 owners and, and the like. I could see some of that stuff happening. How big a difference does the fact that the PlayStation 4 will be $100 less than the Xbox One make in the consumer? And again, you know, of course, from the gaming perspective, if you're, you know, a fan of one flavor or the other, you'll tend to skew towards it. But for somebody who's in the middle, like, well, I don't know, I just want a box to watch stuff on and occasionally play games on. Well, well I, mean, I mean, as of now, yeah. a $399 uh, PS4, which is $100 cheaper than the Xbox One, is also $200 more expensive than a Roku or an Apple TV, which are doing very well in that market, uh, filling up the, hey, I just kind of want to watch this service on my television kind of niche. I disagree with Scott in that I do not think things are coming with Xbox are coming back in front of that paywall. I think that they are doubling down and going to do more and more and more behind that paywall. And I think that that's where we're going with these kind of boxes. They're saying, well, let's justify as a set top experience. Let's justify that $400 and $500 price tag by saying, oh yeah, the new Halo series, which, you know, would be the craziest thing ever in the world. Or <laughs> as has been my crazy lunatic crackpot, uh, theory with the Xbox that they will be the bidder, they will be the winning bidder for NFL Sunday ticket, they can say, all right, here's a massively huge original content franchise that you now have to pay X amount of money for and then a bunch more per month to get. Yeah, you are you may be right. I think it's a huge mistake, and here's why. Well, see, you're doing that thing that's reminding me, again, content is king. If they own a piece of content, whether it's a licensed piece of content or not, and you can't get it anywhere else, well, of course they're going to hide it behind that paywall. But when it comes to putting Netflix behind a paywall, when all your competition, including all these lower-cost devices you mentioned, which are doing well in the marketplace, when those don't have paywalls like that, the choice becomes much harder to say to justify that Xbox One. Now, Sunday NFL ticket is going to be a huge thing for a whole bunch of people and worth every penny for them, and they'll sew up whatever that market is. But I feel like this. I feel like if these guys don't jump into this new era, this new this new generation of set top box slash game console, and they don't do it with a much more open, uh, sort of non exclusive kind of way of moving forward, they're both going to lose. Because gamers yeah. are savvy. Home entertainment people are getting more savvy. I don't think it's just as simple as saying, ah, oh, you had an Xbox before. You liked it, right? Well, they get, you got to get the next one because who knows what other hell device you could buy that would ruin your life. Now, what about, what about this, Scott? What if, could you see a world where, let's say, Xbox wants to, to keep everything behind their, their paywall? Uh, could it be that we start seeing, uh, you know, uh, that they push Xbox 360s for $99? Now you are competing with those Roku boxes and you're in the ecosystem. So you're getting the Sunday ticket and all the exclusive content and, uh, and, and all that stuff. Like, is that something that you could see them attacking the higher end and the lower end of the ecosystem at the exact same time? Well, if that happened, would that put the squeeze on PS4? It would, but I don't see how they 
Well, I mean, you know, all the talk about the 360 being uh, on a chip now and them shipping that thing in like a tiny little box and that was going to be a direct competitor to things like Apple TV and things like Roku, that made a lot of sense to me, that rumor. I thought that had some real legs. The chip part is actually true. Some, you know, they, they, there are engineers at Microsoft confirming they've got a thing about this big running 360 games and running 360 ecosystem and, and OS and everything else. So I thought, I really thought on stage they were going to say, there's this hot new thing. It's going to play all the latest games, it's going to have all this stuff, all this interface stuff. And for you guys who just want a little TV player and it also plays your old games, check it out. Here's this little one. And it's tiny and it fits under everything and it's not going to cost, it's going to cost you a hundred bucks. I mean, that, I think that was maybe a missed opportunity and I guarantee well, that was on the table at some point, but it probably also made them think they were going to compete with themselves. And I understand that on the media side, but that's I mean, how listen, you do it. It is, it is a very old lesson with Microsoft that just because Microsoft can do it or has created it does not necessarily mean that we will ever see it. Uh, yeah. that, is, that, is, that is a very, very old song to sing. Although I think it would be very interesting, Brian, if they did come out with a lower cost set-top box. Although I don't know whether that, that, takes, that takes away from, again, it's the Xbox One, the one thing you own. The one thing that is worth $500 that does everything you could possibly want. That's what Microsoft wants to want, wants to have. And I don't know if a lower cost model takes away from that strategy. Uh, one other set-top box to chime in on. Boxy is looking for either a big round of funding or potentially to be bought out. They hired a firm to try to secure another $30 million. Now, keep in mind, they have raised around $30 million since 2008. Uh, last funding round was a couple of years ago when it picked up 16 and a half million. They've tried to brand their new newest box as a cloud-based DVR, distancing themselves from the, uh, you know, watch content that you got online by whatever method, uh, place it has not resonated with, uh, with purchasers, consumers. So now they're in a situation where we either need a lot more money or they put out feelers saying, or if you're looking for an all-in-one solution for whatever your cable service is and an awesome interface and box, we could talk about being bought out as well. Is this uh, is this super bad news for for Boxy or is this? this is, um, th these guys are the they're the they're the BlackBerry of this fight. They're the the hacker darling that couldn't couldn't go past when it, when all the stuff kind of went mainstream and Roku's became a thing and they were affordable and Apple TV kind of made a little bit of a, a stink and all these again game consoles started changing things. It's like those guys could not figure out quick enough how to become relevant enough. To be the thing people want, wanted to get. And if I mentioned Boxy or Roku to just folk I know in the neighborhood who don't know Jack about most of this stuff, and I said those two names, they'd know Roku, they would not know Boxy. I think yeah, they have an uphill point. battle, and I feel like they're, they're Blackberry in this thing right into the dirt. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on. We're running behind here, so let's jump right into Film Film. The new Elysium trailer is uh, completely awesome. It's available right now. I don't think we have time to really watch a lot of it. Did you guys get a chance to take a look at it? Yeah, I can't. Uh, I have not, no, but I'm looking uh, forward to it because I was kind of left a little bit cold by the first one. Uh, well, the first one didn't really give you a lot of the story. This one at three minutes, you get a substantial amount of, of what the story is about and the character and why you should care about it. Uh, the only thing I worry about it is that um, it may be the kind of thing where... I, uh, the the marketing for District 9 did such a good job of selling the world that you went into the movie really not having any idea what the story was. This one, you're seeing substantial elements of the story. And the question is, are they really showing the bulk of the first two acts or is this all stuff that happens in the first 30 minutes and the real story is what comes later on? Yeah, I'm, I'm beyond excited for it. Uh, uh, to keep it short on my end, I just think it looks like the, it's maybe the movie I'm most excited about for the rest of this year. Uh, despite biases in the movie draft, which we don't have to talk about now, um, I hope it does really well. I, I think Bloom Camp has a, you know, a chance to be one of my favorite directors. If this is as cool as it looks, I'm beyond excited about it. Scott, you I like a to lot think of, of it as a sequel to Beyond the Candelabra. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> So, Scott, uh, you watch a lot of reality television? Uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but I do like anything with rednecks in it. A lot of, lot of self-absorbed teenagers posting party pics. That's what you like? Don't like that at all. I like guys that go to pawn shops and sell stupid swords and stuff. I, I, I could eat that. <laughs> or people that hoard a lot of crap and find dead cats under things. I'm into that. 
All right, so we've got uh, summer break is happening, coming up, and you guys are probably going to hear about this. Essentially, it looks to me that uh, it's, they're following nine teenagers, but it's basically everything that you get out of, we'll say, a Jersey Shore minus that that one show that actually comes out uh, once a week. Instead of uh, taking all the clips and crafting these these uh, backbiting narratives, everything will happen live, real time over their accounts. You they They cast this exactly the way... They usually cast reality television shows looking for the same kind of characters, but they just have everyone posted on, you know, their Tumblr. They have a, a recap video once per day, a one-minute video that'll post. There's an official uh, summer break uh, Twitter account that's going to be managed and curated. When people are at parties, they're going to be expected to snap a bunch of photos, which a team of 45 people are going to immediately post to accounts on Instagram. My guess is uh, instead of having editors create these fights after the fact it sounds like you're gonna have posters sort of create drama live real time that'll be fought out on the air and i can't decide now uh, you the three of us are not the target demographic for this thing but uh, you and i whether we like to or not we experience the drama of these reality television shows we just don't watch them in the half hour or hour long format so essentially they're taking the way the bulk of america experiences reality television and giving it to them just the part in the way that they that they that they I think this might be brilliant. I don't know. Just I have to deal with the, I have to deal it's with internet failure. trolls anyway. I don't want to watch a show or have watch a thing or even watch an internet thing happen in real time or slow time or any time that helps glorify internet trolling. That's I mean, I here's the I have thing. No interest. Like Brian, we know these specific people who make cretins like this seem interesting by way of editing. You know, yep. Yep. like the raw footage on this stuff is often horrifying. Like we know people who are in and I don't mean horrifying, like, oh, what horrible things they did. I mean, like, this is boring. How are we going to make a show out of this? Yes. Uh, so to just do the raw footage, I think, is kind of missing the point of why reality television is as successful as it is, which is there are very hardworking people behind the scenes who are putting together these stories. And uh, if, if that element is going to be missing, then I think that the, the success will reflect yes. its missing piece. Awesome. Uh, okay. Well, uh, also, uh, Steve Jobs' biopic Jobs finally has a release date. It's U.S. It's uh, August 16th. Are you guys going to go see this? No. Maybe. <sighs> not in theaters. No, probably not. It's hey, the other one I it? might. The Aaron, the Aaron Sorkin one I might. Not this one, though. This one seems real dumb to me for some reason. I don't, I'm trying not to let all my biases against who's in it and who wrote it and all that stuff get in the way, but I feel like this thing is destined for trouble. So, uh, no 50 okay, bucks now, from I mean, the reviews all, aren't great. Like, like, it's already been reviewed. It hit the festival circuit a couple times. So, I mean, it, it's, I'm excited. I will see it eventually because obviously I, I think we are all on some level interested in the subject matter or at least how it's at least handled. Uh, it's a story that we've all talked about ad nauseum. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not going to rush out and see it. Yeah. Uh, no, let's no do rush. this. Uh, there is uh, on io9 a spoiler-free preview of Stephen King's new show, Under the Dome. Did either of you guys read the book? Yes, I loved Under the Dome. Loved okay, it. Okay, I actually have it in my Audible queue, but I haven't gotten to start reading it yet. And now I'm kind of in a weird place of, as Justin and I have talked about in many times, including on Night Attack, uh, I, I've kind of been brought around to where I feel like I should watch the show first and then read the book. Yeah, here's the thing about Under the Dome that worries me a little bit, and... um you know, I don't want to. I don't want to make too much of this, but it worries me just a little bit that the way that book ended. Uh, this isn't. I'm not trying to spoil anything, but it it didn't end in a way that. Let's put it this way: if you're Lost fans, the final episode of Lost either pissed you off or made you happy. That's how this will end. It'll either make you mad or make you real happy in the ways that Lost might have. And I, that, again, right. that doesn't spoil anything, but it kind of says something to the. He's what, saying what, it involves a magical cave. <laughs> there are no, there are no magical caves, and there are no uh, Palos and what's her names getting buried halfway Maybe. through the season or anything like that. But it is a, it's one of those things where I feel like it's an idea I would have had when I was twelve, and I would have said, "What if a giant dome was just going to land here and you couldn't get out of it, and everybody was inside that was inside, and like if a dog was halfway out, like chop the dog in half, and there'd be, you know, like I can see myself coming up with this idea when I was a kid." But Stephen King does that with his concepts, and then just runs with it and the relationships and the personalities involved it's an awesome book so 
If they do this right, the, the journey will be worth no matter what the ending is, if they ever end it. Right on. Uh, yeah. Game of Thrones is the most pirated uh, finale, or the Game of Thrones finale is the most pirated ever on BitTorrent. Flat out, full stop. King of the what cheapskates! King of the cheapskates! <laughs> now, how much of this... Now, this is a great title for HBO because, as we've talked about before, HBO is really interested in the reputation of creating extraordinarily high-quality content that encourages people to pay to be part of the HBO team. Uh, but is this a case where the, the headline certainly indicates that this is the most popular thing ever, but you got to remember that HBO sort of, on purpose, creates a black market by making it difficult to get it through any kind of legitimate source unless you are a paying HBO customer, right? Well, well yeah, a paying my... cable or satellite right. customer and then a paying uh, HBO customer. So even it, it's it's two levels there. But yeah, uh, it, it's it, it, it interesting to me the fascination that people have with with this story, and it is certainly not, noteworthy since it is the most uh, the most pirated in an era when you know most television is uh, kind of more ex accessible, except for HBO, which has kind of kept it strictly behind uh, the paywall, unless you know a friend to give you your HBO Go account or something like that. I understand. I mean, they're in a weird position where they want to keep people subscribed and get people to subscribe that weren't before, so they put out amazing content that should feed that machine and keep that cycle happening, but. I would really love to pay for more and even obscure and old HBO content on a kind of piecemeal basis. I would gladly subscribe to that via services like iTunes or other pay services, Amazon, whatever. What I don't is know that why they stuff don't... on iTunes, right? Uh, not, I don't not think always. so. Yeah, but, I think they, it's do, old... they do some stuff. Yeah, yeah you yeah, might get Oz, Oz or something or something that's you know, super ancient, but they're not doing I know anything. The Wire. the Wire was on there for a while. I don't know if it's still mm. Yeah, right. but the, my point is, it's it does seem like an opportunity for them watch, to double Scott. flip. Oh, you should dude, watch I know. The Wire. Why don't you watch know, The Wire right now in uh, front of us? I'm yeah. dying to watch The Wire. I've been meaning to for years. It isn't one of those things where I'm like, I don't know about that Wire. It's I have meant to, and things keep coming up. Things like Justified and Walking Dead and Game of Thrones and okay, fifty other things. Okay, stop, shame. Stop, stop, shame. Stop. Those first two were offensive to use the same sentence <laughs> as The Wire. All right. Game Look, of Thrones, like maybe, but those first right. two, do both of us a favor. And, and, and Justified's worth it. Justified's really good. I love, I love Justified. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you that it may be the greatest piece of thing ever made ever. I, I've been told that... Apologize to think, your daughter for not watching <laughs> The Wire yet. <laughs> <laughs> She's watching uh, Captain Sisko get his uh, sweet goatee and shave his head. Everything's fine. <laughs> uh, real quick, uh, there were 170... Thousand simultaneously uh, simultaneous peers over a million downloads in 24 hours. Um, congratulations, HBO. I don't know. Let's uh, let's take a moment and peek in on the movie draft. Justin Robert Young finally on the board. Less than forty million away from taking first place away from me with a massive opening on Man of Steel, a hundred and twenty-eight million dollars uh, at this point since its opening. How are you feeling right now, Justin? Uh, I, again, there's no joy in any of my releases because, like, they all they all need to overperform. So it's like the fact that they do well is really just like, okay, well, I, my my season isn't over. That really is all that I had to to rest my laurels on this weekend was that my season wasn't over. Because basically what it comes down to is that it's a two-man race between me and you. It's the rest of everything but week one of Man of Steel. We'll see how far it can climb if it can get into... 300 or, you know, uh, you know, high 200s in terms of its revenue. Uh, and then that plus Smurfs 2 versus Despicable Me 2, At World's End, and Grown Ups, whatever. And yeah. uh, that will be the tale of the tape. I think if I'm a betting man, I bet on you. But who knows? People seem to really like the old punch em up Superman movie show. And uh, that uh, will be interesting to see. Now, keep in mm. mind, Sarah also still has more releases. She has World War Z, but she paid an awful lot for it. Uh, she has done extraordinarily well in two out of her three movies up to this point. The internship, of, uh, unfortunately, is underperforming significantly. But, like, she has, I believe, like, the number two and the number four best values or the number three and number four best values in the game so far. Well, so, World War Z has to be, like, a Star Trek two level hit for her. 
Like yes. she basically has to, you need, you need like, like the horses. We talk about like, you know, you just need the, the booster rockets to really kind of get you up there. And right now she doesn't have that. She was hoping World War Z is going to be that. And we will see, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think World War Z is, I think they're hoping World War Z is going to be Walking Dead, the movie. And everybody who loves Walking Dead is going to run out and go see that movie. But uh, I don't know whether that's the case. This weekend, we do have World War Z is coming out along with Monsters University. Uh, Monsters University, I would imagine, would do very well for Tom. But uh, Tom might be just just mortally wounded from his After Earth situation. Can we talk about After Earth since Tom's not here? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> what, wait, what do you got to say about After Earth, sir? Woo! Woo! Woo-wee! Yeah. Oh, good God. <laughs> That you can still smell after Earth. <laughs> oh my God! All right, let's uh, let's move on to what we're watching. What we're watching? What are you guys watching? Because I didn't watch anything. I watched the E3 coverage, and then I had shows on the road, and I've caught. I'm pulling a, as I like to call them, a Scott Johnson, and watching mm. old shows nobody cares about. So uh, I've been I only doing have more of the Shield. Well, of course you have. That's why I call it a Scott. I have been. I've been. I've been rewatching all of. Uh, we, we're on a trek bent around here. Um, partly is this, like we were trying in our hearts to get Star Trek to perform better, so I would do better in the movie draft, but that didn't really yeah. happen. Uh, did well, but you know, not enough. Anyway, uh, watching Voyager for some ungodly reason and enjoying the heck out of it for uh, other ungodly reasons. I don't know why I'm liking it so much because I kind of hated it when it came out. Um, but I'm into that. Uh, but I started watching Longmire, which is uh, a new show, and and at least in se- uh, season two. But it is uh, another justified-ish kind of approach to let's make a Western, but make it modern day. And so instead of horses, it's Jeeps and, you know, Broncos and still lots of guns and still lots of hats and still kind of the, a general kind of Western vibe, which I'm always kind of about. And I really, really like Longmire. I had my I had my hesitations. Uh, I knew that uh, Katie Sackhoff was in it, but then when I heard that one of the Agent Smiths, not Agent Smith, but one of the other agents from the Matrix was in it, I'm like, that's the sheriff. Like, how am I going to get it behind this guy? Totally behind that guy. I love this thing set in Wyoming in the middle of, you know, nowhere. They're solving crime every week. It's basically CSI cowboy style. And I wouldn't say it's justified in terms of its overall impact, but it's like a comfortable boot and it fits great and I'm totally into it and I can't really explain why these kinds of shows speak to me but uh, I think Longmire is awesome and people should take some time to watch it. What about you, Justin? What are you watching? Scott. I guess. I just love that stuff. Big wide open spaces, guys who are straight up and honest and they're troubled and they may spend a little too much time with the bottle but in the end, they're going to save your ass and the horse you rode in on. Like there's, I love that stuff. I'm a sucker for it. Just love it. Uh, what about you, Justin? Well, in the same way that uh, guns and uh, spurs and, uh, you know, the the can-do sense of the frontier speaks to Scott, kvetching Jewish people speaks to my soul, which is why <laughs> I recommend the uh, Mel Brooks documentary, Make a Noise, that was on uh, the American Master series on PBS. I'm sure it's available somewhere. I'm a massive Mel Brooks fan. Uh, and it was very, very, very well done. Interviews with pretty much everybody uh, that is still alive, uh, except for Gene Wilder, who's, you know, pretty much a recluse at this point. Um, yeah, you don't hear from him anymore, do you? Yeah. Although apparently he recorded a message that AFI did a tribute to him that I guess is going to air on TNT in a couple of weeks. And apparently he did a recorded tribute for that. But uh, all these interviews are great, great archival footage. Uh, Mel Brooks, make a noise. Right on. Oh, by the way, one uh, quick note about Longmire. You guys remember uh, Lou Diamond Phillips, right? He was a big deal when we were sure. growing up. Yeah. He's great on this show. So he's basically the 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 the, the white man's emissary to the to the uh to the res, they call it, the reservation up there. And he's freaking awesome, that guy. Uh, he's I don't know what the even I don't even, I can't even believe I'm saying it, because I'm not even a Lou Diamond Phillips fan, never liked any of his movies much. Kind of I don't know, just always kind of bugged me. I didn't think he was that great of an actor. He's nailing it in this. He's seasoned in this. He's awesome in this show. Long mind. Right on. Catch it. Uh, well, good. Now <laughs> it's time for feedback. <laughs> now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Yeah. 
except it's not Tom. It's going to be Justin and Scott. Uh, first letter here uh, we got from Derek Chen, who oftentimes chimes in and sets us straight when it comes to the advertising agencies that work on the web. Uh, we had a letter last week about somebody who saw a very adult advertisement for Saints Row. I forget which game it was, but uh, right in front of his kids. And he says, hi, Tom and Brian. Wanted to chime in on the fact uh, on the feedback question about the advert on YouTube. Videos for advertising are subject for review by YouTube, where any objectionable content is rejected, especially when running across YouTube <laughs> in-stream. Uh, once a video is approved, the video should be age-targeted if there's a rating, like an MPAA, ESRB rating. Of course, it gets tricky if a child is watching a YouTube or watching YouTube while logged in under a parent's account. Age-gated videos, which cannot run in YouTube in-stream, are only served in YouTube's in-search. Interesting enough, YouTube's review standards differ from region to region. From what I've gathered, the UK is less strict than the US. Uh, and you know what? Uh, we had one person chime in right now on the, one of the stories we covered last week was uh, Voodoo offering the service of taking your existing DVDs and uh, having them made digital so that you could access them anytime. You could download them. He says, uh, Brent says, after listening to episode 127 last week, I finally decided to give Voodoo's disc at home conversion a try. I've been meaning to try their conversion service before, but never got around to taking my movies to Walmart. He says the process was super easy. And within about 30 minutes, he had 21 movies scanned in to be converted to their digital format. Uh, a couple of DVDs thrown in to upgrade to their HDX format. Out of all the discs, only three to four were unreadable uh, or untranslatable. He says there were several benefits to the process. The biggest was the time savings of not having to rip. It was faster than ripping them uh, and then convert it to an playable format. The biggest con to the service is that while you could download digital copies of your new stuff to your computer or iPad, it looks like they're only allowing standard definition downloads. He was disappointed, but the streaming quality of the HDX entirely overrides that issue for him. He says the cost of the whole process was much more reasonable than he expected. Currently, you get a $2 credit for the first conversion. This essentially makes it you know, $1 to get started. The real hook is that they currently give you a 50% discount when you convert 10 or more discs. So in effect, you're con converting your, your discs for a dollar each and two fifty dollars for DVDs to the higher HDX format. Pricing combined with the ease of use is a hard value to pass on. Uh, thank you so much, Brent. And don't forget, if you guys want to chime in, make sure to write us at fr at twit.tv or frameratereshow at gmail.com. I usually resp reply to those Monday mornings. Uh, thank you so much to both Justin and Scott for joining us. Between the two of you guys, you did a very passable impression of Tom Merritt. Yeah, it was merit-like, wouldn't you say, Justin? Between the two of us, you combine us into one meaty hulk. We become one Tom without a beard. Well, actually, you got a beard. We're all right. We had enough. We had a beard for all of you, folks. Mm. Uh, yeah, Tom esque. I would consider this performance <laughs> by me and and Scott. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, don't forget that you can see new episodes every uh, Monday night, usually, over at twit.tv slash FR. We'll see you guys next week with a real professional running the show. Hot